Hi, everyone. I hope that you are healthy and wealthy. Uh, it's my first online event, so I think that we will have some problems, but we will try our best to make it happen as much perfect as you can imagine. So yeah, today we will have just two lectures. We will have a pause in between. I want to mention that there will be the small delay. So you can text your questions via YouTube, but we will see them in, I guess that 15, 30 seconds. So just don't like blame us if we will do that a bit later. Uh, also, we want to ask you for wait for some answers. So the speakers will answer to them uh, after their talks. So not in the end of the event, but the first couple will answer to the questions after their talk. And then the second speaker will answer to the questions after the second talk. As I said before, we will have like, I think that five, 10 minutes deal, uh, the pause between two uh, lectures, just to make sure that you are comfortable. You can use bathroom, you can drink some water and so on. I hope that you grabbed a lot of beer because as you remember, we always drink some beer, eat. Sorry for that. We can't do that now, like at least like bye to you. But I hope that very soon we will meet together uh, offline finally and drink some beer uh, next time. So as uh, maybe some of you saw already that we announced the second event, which will happen, I guess that less than in two weeks. And uh, there, so we are now we are working on uh, some online bar, some uh, space for you to communicate between each other. Um, so next event, we will do our best to like to do even some networking for you. I think that there is no need for more words. Let's start because we are online and we have a lot of stuff to do. So I want to invite the first couple. Uh, they will do the lecture together. So it's Mihaela and Lukas. Please welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh... Hello. Okay, so once again, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm Michaela and uh, on the other side, uh, you can see the Lukas, my colleague and a friend. Uh, we both work uh, in a, a Sinnesrader Prague uh, as a designers. And um, uh, today we would like to uh, talk about uh, how to control the experience or at least uh, try to do so. Uh, together, we will have a look at some examples of, uh, let's say, thinking glitches, uh, because as a humans, we tend to draw incorrect, uh, incorrect uh, conclusions. We make illogical decisions. And last but not least, we create our own subjective version of reality. Uh, also, please, uh, uh, prepare your phones, for example, and uh, open the menti.com. Uh, 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 we will do some uh, interactive exercise in between, uh, but don't worry, I will tell you uh, before. So, uh, how well uh, can we rely on our perception? And uh, are we even in control of our decisions? Uh, because we talk about uh, illogical conclusions or uh, behavior, well, we would like to start with some examples of uh, visual illusions as a metaphor of uh, rationality. Uh, yeah, as a lot of you probably know this uh, illusion, um, we will not vote on this one. Um, it's a made of two parallel lines with arrows pointing in and pointing out. And uh, yeah, B uh, as a second line appears larger because of the direction of the arrows. Um, when we measure the lines, we can see the proof of the equality uh, and uh, simply uh, we easily see that uh, we were the, let's say victims of uh, this visual illusion, but this one is uh, pretty easy, right? So um, let's move to the harder one. 
the question here is uh, is it the tile A or let's say square A uh, uh, darker or lighter than the B tile? And um, we can clearly see, I think everyone, that the A tile is uh, definitely darker than the B one. So now uh, let's check a proof. Uh, when we extend the, the A tile to the B tile, we see that the tiles are completely identical and that again, our eyes were fooling us. And if I do this, the funny thing is that uh, if we uh, took away the extension, it looks like we didn't learn anything in the last one minute. Uh, you basically, you can't look at the image and say, okay, now I see the re reality or still I see it. Uh, our intuition is uh, repetitively fooling us and uh, we can't do anything with it except in this case, extending the area e A to the area B. So uh, now uh, it's the moment uh, for you to uh, enter the menti.com. And uh, please uh, insert the code you see below. <clears throat> and uh, now please uh, meet Maria. Um, uh, imagine that uh, Maria uh, was a math major in a college and had A plus uh, grades in all of, the, uh, all of her courses in probability and statistics. Uh, the question is, which do you think is more likely to be true? A, Maria is a portrait artist, or B, Maria is portrait artist who also plays a poker. Now uh, we will give you like uh, 20 seconds uh, for the answers and uh, Dukash will then share the results. Yeah, let's wait a couple of uh, seconds because we have some delay in the streaming. So uh, I would say let's wait maybe one minute and we'll see. So yeah, some votes are appearing. That's a good sign. So keep on going. Yeah, and please uh, use the, the Menti and not, not the live chat on the YouTube if you can, because then we can uh, have better results. <laughs> Yeah, okay, it seems like you are still a little bit voting, so please uh, vote now uh, or uh, never. Yeah, and the code... Uh, yeah, I can see some messages that the code was... It was too fast, okay, wait. But I can... Yeah, so the code is 40-92-08. 40 Yeah, some votes are still appearing, so let's wait a couple of seconds and then we can move on, I think. Yeah, I could see that the, the answer was <laughs> for the moment there, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, so uh, you have a really like, nice uh, audience because uh, right now it's uh, absolutely 50-50, uh, the results. So uh, not the A, not the B, it's really 50-50. Now it's 51% for B. Okay, so uh, 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 you could see now the, the highlighted correct answer and 
the question is how do we know which statement uh, is more likely to be true and why it's exactly the a uh, more likely to be true um, uh, because as a, as a humans um, we tend to create the stories and uh, vivid images uh, so the things make more sense even though uh, then we ignore uh, what's evident what's logically correct and what has the bigger probability uh, statement a uh, it's uh, statistically uh, statistically more correct or correct uh, because it's less specific version uh, when we add it uh, to the option b uh, a extra condition then the probability is is decreasing uh, yeah but don't worry uh, nothing wrong about it uh, just to share with you uh, that the inner studies which were uh, run um, uh, on this topic uh, it was up to 80 percent of uh, participants chose the option b that maria also plays a poker uh, yeah so you might ask uh, what happened there and uh, and uh, why to care uh, on a previous task uh, we could see our tendency to look for the shortcuts uh, and uh, like the, the easier solution what would like come up to our mind and we've experienced uh, one of the cognitive biases known uh, as a conjunction or logical fallacy and uh, and what is the cognitive bias um, uh, cognitive biases are a psychological mechanism and tendencies uh, that cause that human brain uh, draw incorrect conclusions and yeah, in short we could just say that the cognitive bias is um, systematic uh, error in our way of thinking uh, yeah on the left side uh, it's like a bunch of the cognitive biases uh, in case you would be interested we can later share the link and it's interactive it's pretty nice um, and now, yeah, to answer the question of uh, uh, why to care, uh, um, like if you are aware of, of those uh, um, systematic errors, cognitive biases, you can use them uh, for better in your life and daily work or worse if you are not somehow aware of it. Um, and yeah, um, one of the great references or like source of the information uh, is a book uh, from Daniel Kahneman. Uh, it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, yeah, shortly, uh, what he's reading about, of course, cognitive biases, but also about uh, uh, fast thinking, which, which some of you experience with the Maria task. Uh, fast thinking is intuitive, emotional, and operates quickly, uh, while the slow thinking is more logical. It uh, needs more effort or mental activity. And maybe to give you some short example in a like real life, uh, uh, fast thinking uh, is great to have. Uh, for example, when you are driving on a highway and um, uh, some danger pop up, uh, uh, then your fast thinking, uh, uh, or let's say system one, as Kahneman um, call it, reacts even, even before you could analyze it with your uh, slow thinking. And the slow thinking uh, you use when you do something which needs more mental effort, um, for example, at a work, if you are analyzing something or uh, yes, yeah, simply you need to think more. Uh, yeah, I think um, okay, there was some uh, technical problem. Okay, let me let me again share my screen. Okay, uh, now it should be fine. Mm, yeah, I don't know what, what you heard uh, like last, but um, 
yeah, to sum it up, uh, uh, there are like more than 100 uh, cognitive biases. And uh, yeah, we definitely don't want to torture you today uh, with every single one. And honestly, we don't even know them all. Uh, we just want to share with you some of those biases and generally some psychological principles together with the fails uh, uh, from our lives or work that we've experienced. It. And yeah, definitely uh, we are not here to laugh at anyone. It's not about who is more intelligent or stupid or something like that. Uh, cognitive biases are just weird and uh, simply everyone experiences it. And um, if you think you don't, there is also one bias for that, that it's called blind spot bias. Um, yes, yeah, so now uh, let's move uh, to the example. Uh, this is example uh, from our uh, project we work on uh, with Lukas. It's a Volkswagen website. And uh, here uh, we were working on a, on a one specific uh, component. Uh, it's combination of a text and uh, images uh, next to each other or below each other. Uh, but the question is what belongs where? Uh, it can be uh, perceived uh, as a this, as a, in, a, in a horizontal way or uh, like this in a vertical way. Um, Original, like to say uh, that the original purpose of this module was a usage on a magazine pages. It was meant to be uh, for uh, longer paragraphs with the possibility to add uh, some images to co-create the atmosphere. And uh, this is the example how it was mentioned. Uh, so it was mentioned to be vertical as like old school uh, newspaper. newspaper. Uh, yeah, but uh, there is this uh, thing uh, that when we went um, live with our MVP version of the website, uh, we uh, didn't uh, develop much of the module. So authors use this module for um, completely different purposes than uh, we mentioned. Uh, so it was not used for the longer paragraphs in magazine style. They use it in a horizontal way, which suited their needs and created this, this uh, different pattern. So uh, yeah, something like this uh, happened uh, with our users. This is how they somehow reacted. You could see uh, that it was not really clear what belongs where and what belongs together. And this is a so-called uh, law of proximity. It's not exactly the cognitive bias, but it belongs to Gestalt uh, psychology, but yeah, somehow it's connected. And basically it means that in our minds, we group things uh, which are close to each other. And then uh, it seems they logically belong uh, together. And uh, yeah, so uh, somehow like lesson, lesson learned, um, uh, yeah, we should always consider uh, the content context uh, along with the combination with the whole, uh, let's say more complex work in the CMS, maybe at more restrictions uh, for the authors and predict the usage uh, might be totally different uh, than was our intention. And yeah, that uh, even like uh, test it in some edge cases and learn, learn from it. Um, you don't have to run uh, some user test. You can just ask a colleague or someone else sitting next to each other, maybe on different project. And uh, also how we could avoid this. It's, it was like usage of more spacings between items that don't belong to, uh, to each other uh, and a group those uh, who belongs. And it could, it could be done um, with a, with a spacing, bigger spacing, as I said, visual separators, like lines, background color, or animation. So it would be more, more clear what's coming first, what's next. Um, yeah, now uh, I will hand over the rights to Lukash. Yeah, great. Uh, I will right now share my screen then. <clears throat> yeah. And let's go to another example, uh, which is uh, focused on totally different uh, bias and that's called uh, bizarreness effect. 
And uh, basically, to give you some introduction, uh, yeah, I've been working on uh, just helping out with the animations of one of the Czech uh, TV series, which are plans to be uh, streamed online, uh, I think this year. And, uh, and basically, as you can see, it has like really strong, different visual uh, experience, I would say. And uh, it was really interesting to work on such a thing, uh, which was like really thought through. And uh, maybe it, it doesn't look like that, but, uh, but everything was really done to the details. So uh, in this bizarre project, let's say uh, like that, which is called Tlachenka, uh, which is something like meatloaf uh, in English. Uh, yeah, we were working on a, on a series uh, which are focused uh, on a political situation in the Czech Republic. So everything was localized uh, just for Czech audience and probably no translation is even possible. But nevertheless, uh, the project was really planned uh, well and, uh, and everything to every detail. So we even had the merch, such as, of course, tote bags. Uh, you can't live without them. Uh, then uh, some uh, fake tattoo uh, stickers, uh, what you can use and, and promote uh, basically the, uh, the show. Uh, then some website existed uh, and exists uh, where you can see the characters and, uh, and some other uh, things which appears uh, in there uh, during, the, uh, during the series. But basically, uh, then we had a first screening, uh, just the test screening of the, one of the episodes uh, of the TV show. And uh, basically this was in Brno in, uh, in one cinema. So some people came, of course, were interested because we ran the campaign before on Startovac CZ uh, to yeah, promote and gather some things. Uh, so this was in cinema. And that was the moment where basically for the first time we uh, gathered some feedback from the viewers in general. So at the entrance, we gave them a printed form uh, and they just filled in uh, their impressions uh, after the screening and then they uh, gave it back to us. And until now, uh, everything was running really well. It was a lot of fun. Uh, okay, we are creating these bizarre animations. Everything is like rough. There are a lot of uh, inside jokes uh, in the animations and hidden meanings and everything makes sense. Uh, but uh, actually, as we read through the, the feedback, uh, it was like really interesting because uh, the first point about the visual, okay, uh, mixed feelings, uh, but more like uh, that it's interesting, it's cool, it's something totally different, something on the edge. Of course, it's not for everyone, but, uh, but mostly it was like positive. Then it was a question about the characters in the in the series, and uh, and basically the people were really like confused. Uh, they didn't really know uh, what uh, uh, who is who and uh, what belongs where, uh, why this uh, character or person is acting like that, why the strange name is there, and uh, they didn't really get that. Uh, this was pretty much similar with the story where. Uh, the viewers uh, were basically uh, saying, yeah, I didn't really get what's happening there, uh, why uh, it is still like this. And uh, it, basically the episode was just 10 minutes and, uh, and the people were totally lost in a couple of minutes. Uh, and then the overall topic, uh, because there was some introduction in the cinema on the first screening uh, that it's like about political situation in Czech Republic. So they were kind of like, yeah, we know, but we are not totally sure. Uh, and they were wondering like, what is the overall message out of it? So uh, as you can see, uh, yeah, there is basically just one uh, from four uh, positive things and that could be the visual, uh, but the three others uh, basically failed, uh, let's say. And uh, mm, this gives you uh, really nice feedback, uh, which is basically 
uh, described in the bizarreness effect that uh, the bizarre should be always uh, understandable because uh, otherwise uh, it, it is just bizarre and it's just maybe for your kind of pleasure and for some inside fun uh, with your friends uh, or co-workers which were uh, involved in project but it's not uh, usable for the um, basically public audience or your friends or relatives or someone from the street and uh, here as you can see of course uh, some nice example of bizarre it's old spice and it's like famous because of that and it's really recognizable uh, and on the other hand uh, there are some different ways how to do uh, some bizarre and uh, we basically uh, find uh, by accident kind of uh, these nice uh, optical illusions uh, which are made by i guess ddb and it's uh, advertisement for a uh, feature in the car, some 360 camera. And uh, they actually use these optical illusions uh, to demonstrate uh, that you can overlook some things. Uh, so this is really nice also example of a uh, just really basically simplified bizarreness. Uh, and this is the key message that uh, it's totally okay to do some bizarre things and strange things and really try to explore some edge cases and everything, but always uh, we need to uh, take a look uh, from the other side, uh, how other people see the project and the thing. Yeah, uh, then we have another example and uh, that's again from the CMS. It probably looks familiar already for you, but uh, this is not the same component. It just looks uh, similar. Uh, but this was also interesting because here uh, we were actually having a discussion and uh, during these times we were working on uh, with Misha on the focus state uh, uh, in the in the Volkswagen project and we were really like deep dive in the uh, in the focus states how the accessibility work and how it should look how it should be designed uh, what we can do about it and then uh, we are just having a discussion with a colleague of us. Uh, just working on this and and then actually I was asking uh, him yeah but uh, why this uh, focus state looks like this or is the color uh, a Volkswagen color or uh, should we kind of like think about the design there but then uh, I realized that uh, basically it's just the it was just the uh, hover effect on the component which was in sketch and uh, and so this was like really nice moment that uh, I just realized, okay, uh, that's something uh, that is not wrong here, is, is not is not right here, and uh, and basically it means that the perfection uh, doesn't mean that it's always the best performance. It's just not equal, and uh, what's most likely can happen uh, that from perfection uh, you will just. Uh, switch to obsession really easily and that's even worse because uh, then you can't really see uh, the other things and this is what the attentional bias uh, actually describes and is talking about and uh, and here also similar as Misha mentioned before it's important to always uh, step really back out of uh, your uh, interest and maybe your current uh, situation or project and uh, or your hobbies maybe because then it can really easily happen uh, that uh, you'll just focus on the things uh, you are good at or you are really interested in a uh, nice example could be in the typography and that's for example you are a fan of typography and therefore you are really checking all the kernings and, uh, and spacings and line heights and uh, uh, typefaces but you can totally uh, lost the overview maybe what was happening uh, on the background or uh, that something is totally wrong uh, and not written right for example and uh, also nice uh, example uh, in this uh, attention bias is uh, the saying that uh, if you have a hammer everything looks like a nail which is pretty much describing this uh, yeah and that's from my side. And now I will hand over back to Misha.
Okay, you should see the screen now. Um, yeah, I promise this is the last time uh, we are switching the screens. Um, uh, yeah, on, on the left side, uh, you can see the, the fresco of the Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe or probably most of you know this story or uh, yeah, you, you heard about it. It was pretty fun. And yeah, in case uh, someone of you doesn't know this, uh, uh, in uh, 2012, um, uh, a woman called Cecilia Gimenez, uh, she attempted a restoration attempt uh, of this fresco and it ended up uh, like this. Yeah, so uh, yeah, let's say it didn't uh, work out uh, really well. Uh, yeah, here we have a, a, just a video in, a, in the background, no sound. I will just comment what's happening in the video. Uh, someone is interviewing uh, the lady and uh, she's kind of giving the excuses like uh, that she didn't have a proper time to, to, to uh, restore the, the fresco uh, because she had to go to visit her son and that uh, when, when she came back uh, there was a, a like total madness. Everyone was uh, mad, and everyone was telling her like, "Please stop! Don't continue. Uh, we need to um, call some real uh, re restaurateur." And um, uh, yeah, and uh, also she mentioned that uh, this never happened to her. That she's uh, she has some experience uh, in a painting. She had like multiple of the of uh, exhibitions and she just don't get it. And yeah, this might be a truth uh, that maybe the, the woman uh, uh, paints uh, or do some nice paintings, but clearly uh, she was missing um, uh, the expertise in this field of uh, repairing the frescoes. And yeah, so uh, you might ask, uh, what does this mean? Uh, and um, maybe why this happened? And, um, uh, explanation is here. Uh, um, this is a bias called uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, and um, uh, on a scale, um, oh, sorry, on, on a graph, uh, the, the lady with a Jesus fresco would be on a, on a top left. And um, basically this graph is saying that the uh, people uh, with the lower expertise uh, has a really high uh, confidence and, uh, uh, and simply they don't know uh, what they don't know. And uh, then the curve uh, is going down as you learn more things, you're, you're like losing uh, the confidence because then oppositely you are aware of, of the things you need to learn more or that there is a more uh, to learn. And then again, the curve is going up when, when there, are, uh, there is someone who is already pro professional, has the, the, the exact expertise, then um, he or she again uh, gain the confidence. Uh, yeah, and uh, now <laughs> you might ask the, the, the thing, like how, how the thing with the Jesus Fresco lady and the teamwork uh, and the effort uh, and, and basically the whole Dunning-Kruger effect is connected. Uh, uh, let's say that the uh, lady with the fresco uh, restoration, uh, uh, when she would be, let's say, like somehow estimating the, the effort, uh, she would probably say that, uh, yeah, this work is easy peasy, I can do it right now. And someone else, uh, could say that it's more complicated. Uh, for example, that it takes half of the year to, to do it properly. But um, in her case, there was probably no one else uh, to argue with her. And uh, yes, yeah, something uh, like this on a smaller scale can easily happen in uh, our daily work. And uh, therefore we always uh, yeah, have to talk about the problem and its, its efforts uh, and yeah, not just the design wise, but also from a developer perspective and the feasibility. And yes, yeah, simply everything is um, about the dialogue. We discuss all the aspects uh, so it's clear how to proceed further and um, everyone is uh, simply on the same page. Um, yeah, what's like 
this is another bias which is uh, uh, kind of also connected with that uh, it's called a uh, curse of knowledge and yeah you might say like what the heck uh, what is the curse of knowing something and um, uh, in short um, it, it means that uh, we tend to overestimate the final result uh, if we already know the answer or solution. Um, yeah, to give you some example, maybe um, uh, did you ever uh, invested like uh, a lot of time in uh, researching the uh, user needs that at the end you over deliver the features and then uh, your users uh, didn't um, understand it or didn't even use it as it was intended or maybe design uh, of a logo with a perfect meaning and a metaphors but a client uh, uh, didn't like it because they didn't get it and yeah that's basically it because the the curse of knowledge is uh, uh, inability to put yourself uh, to your uh, listener li listeners co-worker or client uh, shoes when you are explaining them something uh, because you're too much in the topic and um, yeah the 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 sol solution is uh, just like step back uh, explain the process uh, uh, because uh, others might not invest the same amount of the time uh, as you did in some specific topic um, and in most of the cases, it, it's more important to showcase the whole path and the final outcome. Uh, then, sorry, uh, the whole path, like over the creation of your thoughts, uh, than the final outcome uh, without the proper explanation. Yeah. So um, yeah, now we would like to also uh, step back, and uh, we have a final exercise for, for you. So uh, please again. Uh, go to the menti.com if you still have a power to do so. Would you share the code again? Because I think that maybe it will be useful for. People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to give them some time. <laughs> and yeah, the code is uh, 546755. This time we will stay on, on the screen. And yeah, you probably see the, the question uh, in the mente. So the question is, which uh, red circle is a bigger, A or B? Or maybe they are equal. Quite interesting. How will they answer if they're equal? <laughs> uh, there should be uh, the third option. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, people are already voting, so that's nice. Also, I saw a lot of answers in YouTube, so maybe you should count them as well. Last time it was like that. Yeah, we, we can't really include it to the percent then, but maybe we can try if something will appear there. Um, yeah, but now I, I can see that no one is voting. But I think for uh, to the chat, you can also write uh, your guess uh, how many times we said step back. Uh, that's just some <laughs> side competition. Uh, <laughs> we will count it if the situation will be again equal 50 50. Yeah, so someone can't see the code. Uh, so the code is five, four, six, seven, five, five. Better, do you see the screen? Because maybe you don't see the code because you don't see the screen. Seems like it's it works now, yeah. Okay, yeah. let's wait a couple of seconds. People are still voting, not decided. Maybe they, they are measuring it, who knows? Yeah, and don't, don't please don't measure it. <laughs> it should be, yeah. <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah, okay, so let's wait a couple of seconds and then we can we can move forward. Yeah, nothing else is appearing. Uh, so I would say we are done uh, with this exercise. So thanks a lot for the votes. Okay, so here is the revelation. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, on the even the next slide, um, we can see that the basically the A uh, one was bigger. Uh, most of you actually ninety six percent of the votes is uh, is equal, and then. Uh, 4% for B, that it's bigger. Uh, and basically, yeah, this is typical uh, optical illusion, uh, but we basically decided to do it on purpose uh, that it's not the same, uh, just to showcase and, and explain that, uh, okay, maybe you are aware of uh, these things that it exists, but it doesn't mean that it's always like that. So, Nevertheless, you should always uh, measure and think about it and, uh, and compare and test everything uh, to make sure that uh, it's still valid and, and uh, you are on the basically right uh, path how to do stuff. Thank you. I think that, yeah, so thank you. And thank you. That's it from our side. Uh, and of course, feel free to reach us uh, if you have any yeah, questions or insights or you would like to share something, just uh, let us know. Thanks a lot. Yeah, now you can text your questions via YouTube. Uh, you remember about the delay. That's why we will be waiting for them. I guess that for the next 30 seconds. There was one question from, uh, oh yeah, a lot of applause. Yeah, Ooh, thank you. Uh, I think that I just replicated a lot of applause from that side. So yeah, that there was one question from Alexandra. I remember it, uh, the question, I mean. So uh, Misha, you told about that situation with Volkswagen, about that the, the text was uh, near the picture and people could miss the point where does it belong to. So the question is, is it the problem of person who plays these posters together or this is problem of the designer who didn't write a guide? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say that it's like mi mixture of, of the of the things. Yeah, um, yeah. Because as I said, the the like in a CMS, uh, you can use at the end, uh, or you could use this module uh, uh, for different purpose than the we as a designers intention like intention with it. Um, and uh, so yeah, there was a fault like let's say on our side because uh, we could somehow predict this this uh, usage or misusage let's say but then there is also another point of view uh, because in such a huge project sometimes it's not so easy to um, uh, uh, yeah like to process things yeah because then there's ad, uh, like another part then um, someone else they, it's using it and filling in the content yeah uh, so um, and the, then it's like also the, the matter of the picture so pick picture if it doesn't correspond with the text um, yeah so that's yeah it's, <laughs> I would say it's a mi mixture of the of those things but yeah what's what's like important that lesson was learned. <laughs> Lukas, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, I think pretty much everything was said uh, to this. Uh, yeah, it's just really the decision uh, and about the communication always. Uh, if the component, for example, should be open to everyone and used anywhere, then of course uh, the design needs to be adjusted to that 
uh, yeah, on the other hand, uh, I think it's a good way also sometimes to set some restrictions, uh, for example, for the content authors uh, that they just uh, really can use it in just some certain way. Uh, yeah, that's, I think, I would say the only thing which matters at the end. Thank you. We have one more question. Could you please recommend any other UX psychology related books? Mm. Is it no? <laughs> uh, no, I'm just thinking. Um, yeah, but uh, I have like pretty big list. So if you would send me the email, I can, uh, I don't know, send you the... <laughs> <laughs> photo of, of some books and recommend something. Uh... You could text Michaela because she was still, that's why we didn't delete this slide from the screen. We didn't turn it off. So you can use this uh, email and just text and Michaela will send you all 24 pages of, uh, of those names. Yeah, but I, I would start with the thinking fast and slow in case you didn't read it because yeah, it's like there are huge uh, and a lot of a lot of interesting topics we couldn't cover uh, in this presentation. We have one more question. It came from almost transparent second speaker. Uh, it came from Tim, Tim from Holland. That's why he uh, uh, prefers to text instead of interrupting. So yeah, the question is, uh, how do you educate clients on these biases? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question actually. Uh, so far um, in this specific project, we were showing uh, mostly the Volkswagen. Uh, we don't really, educate, let's say, uh, uh, the client, but uh, we more like are trying to apply the, the principles. So for example, as we were talking about, uh, okay, always show the path that uh, you know, uh, or the client knows uh, what was behind, uh, is a good way how to basically um, be on the same level of understanding uh, what was done and why was it done, or maybe why it wasn't done at all because sometimes you can really end up in some really uh, situation that you can't move forward and it has some meaning. And if you will explain it uh, and show uh, what you just explored and, uh, and uh, how you proceed and what were the obstacles and why uh, it is like that, then usually it's uh, well accepted. So I would say these things are more on our side uh, that we are aware of it and we are trying to uh, more like explain and interact, uh, for example, when we are presenting something. Yeah, maybe I would also add something to that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, the ad advice or what we are trying to do somehow, some, sometimes it's successful, sometimes not so really, but uh, I would say like question everything, yeah, like uh, why, why do you want to do so, why it's like that, uh, where you get it from, uh, let me check some reference or etc. and not just from the client, but also from your colleagues or you bring it yourself and um, uh, yeah, and always like be beware of, of, of the things or sayings like, but everyone knows that something, for example, users don't click or users don't scroll or whatever, or something like, trust me, I'm, I'm no, I know what I'm doing or um, yeah, or something like this has been always like this uh, because a, a lot of studies and a lot of uh, things uh, doesn't have to apply, uh, uh, for example, now on or, or on your um, some exact uh, problem or solution. So uh, yeah, the the thing would be question, uh, ask question, question everything, question the behavior, uh, what kind of data, for example, were used or you have, uh, where did you get it from? Was what, what was the sample size, for example? But yeah, but, but what's like important is to be uh, subtle or um, 
like uh, careful because uh, then there is always the ego part, yeah. Because if you say, oh yeah, it's it's like yeah, you're now behaving irrational, or that this thing you say it's not like this because there is this this this, then you hurt someone. So then there is this, um, uh, yeah, thing that yeah, just to be subtle and just like maybe you can say yeah, we are always we are humans, so we do illogical actions but if you want to change something uh yeah just question uh not just also others but yourself uh because yeah it's easier to see the biases in other people than than uh yourself thank you thank you to both of you guys i think that we should move forward because now it's almost eight o'clock thank you thank you and again it's yeah. like the message from all of the audience. Thank you. So, uh, dear friends, let's have a short break and let's meet in eight minutes. Uh, I'm sure that some of you need to go to the bathroom. So let's meet in eight minutes at eight o'clock. We will start again. Thank you.
Hello, dear friends. So it's eight o'clock on my watch. So I guess that we should move forward. Uh, yeyeah. So I want to introduce next speaker, but uh, before I will do that, I want to mention that on the 16th of May, sorry for the small, uh, small advertising, but you know that I, I want just to share the information about our cool events. So some of you know the, this conference already because it was last autumn, I guess. When was that? I don't remember. So yeah, it, its name is You Excited. Some of people, some of attendees uh, called it You Exhausted because there were a lot of cases, a lot of data and so on. So we decided to do that online this time. So on the 16th of May, it will happen online. There will be cool speakers, really product designers, which will share their cases. No waterish uh, talks, just the data, cases, and that's it. Um, guys from Facebook, Kiwi.com, and other companies, the link is in the description of this event. The, uh, the price is really funny. We don't want to get a lot of money on that. We just want to share this information and just not to postpone that but just to be uh, to you be able to listen to that. So Tim will be one of the speakers there. So today will be the short version of his lecture, but he will share more insights and so on uh, during that conference. And just welcome Tim. You are muted? Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's it. Hi everyone, I hope you're well. Should I already start sharing my screen and get going? Yeah. All right, all right. So, uh, present, oh, sorry. So, now it should be all right, I think. Yeah, all right. So um, today I'll be talking a little about you about uh, human-centered design in the real world. I think we'll soon find out what I mean by that. Uh, I'll share some of my own experiences uh, and case studies there. Um, so let's just get going. Um, so when I first started out designing uh, a while back, um, I was expecting to be this big, uh, like coming up with crazy concepts, wowing people, blowing them off their socks. Um, but in reality, it turned out that I was mostly just, uh, you know, pixel pushing, cranking out the designs, uh, shifting from left to right, did follow the process, got some nice, you know, empathy maps going, got the customer journey uh, right there. Uh, and then I presented it to the business, to my clients, and turned out they didn't give a shit about it. Um, they, uh, that's where I learned that design uh, is the same as business. Um, I quickly learned it. I'll show you a bit of my experience about how I got here. So, a few people have been tricky on the screen. Yeah. So I worked for a few startups. Uh, you can sleep, see me sleeping on a on the desk there, um, and uh, mostly worked for most recently for um, digital health startup, focusing on connecting uh, GPs with patients and and uh, getting the right access to your data there. Um, and later also worked for um, big corporations uh, like Axinobel, for example, Fortune 500 company. I worked there partly as Scrum Master, uh, more focusing on the process and digital transformation and uh, as a UX designer there uh, to implement it. Uh, so right now I work for Kiwi.com. Uh, we're the first, uh, world's first virtual global super carrier. Big fancy words, what that essentially means um, is that we connect different transports together. Uh, it means that we will connect micro-ability to trains, to buses, to flights, carriers that usually don't work together. We'll make sure that you can fly anywhere. So there's new travel options for you. There's more flexibility. Um, and we're operating about 40,000 seats daily to give you a bit of context um, with the biggest markets in the US, Germany, uh, UK, for example. Uh, so that's a bit about my background. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm not talking fully bullshit here. Um, so back to why I think design equals the business. Uh, very simple. Uh, without a proper business, design can't exist. Uh, you can have crazy concepts that wow people, that, that have all the needs covered for users, 
but if it doesn't generate any money for the business, uh, the business will cease to exist and your design with it. Um, so that means you have to ask the question, what does the business like? Well, the business likes maximum profit with no resources or as, as least resources as possible. Um, meaning, why, why should we care about that? Well, um, a profitable business, a business that generates more revenue, has more option to think about designing the long-term run. Um, so you could say, if the business dies, your design dies with it. But you could flip it around as well. You could say, okay, well, if we as designers start thinking about the business perspective as well, and start thinking about the long-term strategic value of design, uh, we can uh, help the business become more profitable and in turn uh, have more revenue available to implement design. So with that said out, I thought, okay, uh, let's do that. Let's come up with some nice strategic uh, designs that will create a lot of uh, value for the business. So I uh, walked into the boardroom as a one-man army, uh, pulled up my, my presentations uh, with one key superpower, of course, which we all have, I think, uh, which is human-centered design. Uh, I think we're all quite aware of that. Uh, you read about it everywhere. Uh, I mean, there's in the Envision blogs, it's uh, uh, like whole medium is full of showing your empathy to the, to the users and using it in your design approach and, uh, and covering those user needs. Again, I find out when in, uh, integrating them that the business didn't give a shit about it. They didn't give that much about an empathy map or that, that my designs cover the needs for the users. They just wanted to see if it had value and impact to them for the business. So, okay, how can you then create the real strategic value of design? And this is something I will talk about now and share my own learnings with you. Um, so I think we're all quite aware of IDEO's Venn diagram of the uh, human-centered design. It's one part the desirable, the needs for people. I think the intention bias that Misha and uh, Luca shared just now, I think that's also come up for us designers as uh, we're a bit of attention bias to the user only. Whereas we also have, we need to have a feasible working product, look at the tech side and look at the business value, which I already discussed just now, which more or less, you know, uh, in a day-to-day -day process turns out that you have to keep these following people happy. You have your, your tech engineer, your tech lead, who is going to build the product you're, develop, uh, you're designing. Uh, you have, of course, your CEO or your boss who, you know, wants to make money and have the thriving business. Uh, and then you have the person you're designing for, this beautiful grandmother. Uh, that I found somewhere online. Um, so talking about that, uh, talking about the bigger picture of design here, um, again, uh, what I found from my personal experience, which I'll share some insights with you, uh, is that you should see it as a whole and not see yourself as a one-man army, uh, but involve others and see it as partners in crime. Uh, just like uh, Han and Chewie, uh, you know, you take your Millennium Falcon and just go to the stars. Uh, so the two main takeaways I want to give you, uh, which I'll dive in later, is involving the right people early on in your process and showing the value of design by engaging with those people. Um, so I'll just share a quick case for my uh, entry when I started out with Kiwi. I just joined there eight months ago um, and I needed something that had quite some impact but didn't involve a lot of effort. Um, to implement, so we could kickstart some some something to get going. Um, fun thing, we were talking about pixel pushing before uh, this project. I didn't touch Figma at all. Uh, it wasn't necessary. Um, so to kick it off, some background context about it. Um, we're designing for travel here uh, at Kiwi, at least. So that means traveling is hectic. You have a lot of signs you can't read. There's people walking around you, family screaming. A baby screaming behind you is just chaos. Um, so what we want to do uh, is we want to make you dream about your trip and uh, let us take care of the planning for you, or at least make it as easy as possible for you to do it so you can uh, get on, on your way. One of the strategies to do that, uh, at least for me, I work for uh, self-service. I manage my booking, which more or less means managing your trip, uh, is having the most important information and actions easily accessible. Um, so uh, this is something that looks like when I started out, I first started analyzing the current situation. Uh, this is the page you see once you have a trip booked. Uh, you can manage anything. 
So I started browsing around looking for usability issues, uh, some, some quick wins there. And I found out, okay, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, sales here, uh, but where's the trip information? Where, how can you find where you need to go next? Um, so, well, the upsell is of course good for the business. Uh, so that needed definitely to be in there, but still uh, the grandmother was said, we needed to have the user needs covered as well. So I set out to again, have this low impact version. So I was thinking, okay, let's try to change the layout without uh, touching any UI, without changing any components and just reorder them. That would also mean uh, my tech lead would be happy because he didn't have to build some crazy concepts and, and spend a lot of time on it. Um, so I started first analyzing what we currently have, dissecting it. Uh, it's a thing called priority guides, um, just plain text. So you're talking on a more higher level on what the elements include. So we just dissect everything on the page, then would go to our market researcher um, and look at the competitors, what they would have uh, on their management booking, do the same thing, dissect it, list it down so you can easily compare. Um, and then involve the user research. So in this case, we had access to a lot of heat maps. We could see that only 31% of the people read baggage uh, on the bottom. Uh, although when talking to customer support, uh, it was most uh, one of the most primary concerns that people called us about. Uh, so there was already something interesting going on there. Uh, then we also looked at some session recordings um, and looked at what are the top features uh, people interacted with in this self-service aspect on management booking, which was boarding passes and flight information. Again, assumptions already, but it's good to show them uh, to the business there, especially with the sessions recordings. Once uh, we showed them to, or I showed them to the uh, PMs uh, and the rest of the business, it started clicking for them, like how they were interacting with it. Um, so the grandmother was uh, satisfied so far. We got a good picture of what her needs were, but we still weren't there yet. Um, so to get in touch with the business side, we listed the same factors uh, of all the elements on the page and connected them to the two primary key drivers of our business. Very important here, which is decreasing the amount of uh, complaints we get about contacting us uh, and generating revenue from the services we sell. Um, so we started connecting those two elements. Um, together with user research, I said to create this Excel sheet, and you could very easily see uh, the amount of costs it would take per uh, element on the page. And very important here is that um, in this stage, I involved uh, both the tech lead and the uh, product manager to really sit down together, look at the data we have, show them the steps I did in between um, and explain to them that we need to prioritize ourselves. Um, so next up, uh, the new MMB then after the prioritization was done uh, with the PM and the tech lead, uh, we did the UX with uh, gathering all the, uh, the context, structuring it together with the PM and the tech lead. And then uh, I did the final job. I, light a little bit, I touched Figma right here, uh, but didn't change much. Um, so this is more or less what it looks like, uh, giving the more prominent focus to your trip timeline. Um, and I'll share the rest later. It's not about the details here. So we had an old and a new version. Um, here you can see the UI changes, but still uh, there was a little bit something missing. We had the tech lead was happy, the grandmother was happy, we had our needs covered, but still, uh, we didn't really know how would I provide the value to the business? How would I make sure that they understand that this design would work? Um, very simple, metrics. Show them some nice, beautiful charts. That's not true. Uh, you don't want this. Um, in reality, a setting up these metrics was more just this. Some uh, scribbles on a whiteboard uh, sit together with the PM, with the product lead there, um, and really make sure uh, involving them in the process and um, making them understand that we need to prove it to the rest of the business as well. Uh, so it's ugly, but it works. Uh, so we had an old and a new version. Then for these metrics, we tested both an A and a B version, the old and the new. Uh, and then at the end, 
uh, and you want one. And that's where we really started convincing the business as well uh, and have all these people happy here uh, about it. So the main takeaway for this specific case I want to give you is uh, involving the right people early. Uh, we already discussed that involving the, the product manager and the tech lead early there. Uh, look at the full picture, not just the user um, and show the value by engaging. Uh, take them with you in the process you do. Start prioritizing with them. Um, uh, make them understand the methods that we do with design. I will show some other cases as well to make it more uh, prominent because this was a very quick, uh, uh, quick project. Um, and because uh, you could say, okay, I work for a bigger company. How do I evolve with way more people to do with way more stakeholders? I don't just have just one PM and just tech lead. Um, so we start, let's look at that. Um, again, tying into the concept of the partners in crime, involving them in your process, um, especially in the bigger companies. I learned fast that uh, you don't want to swim against the current. I think it's like Bruce Lee is saying, uh, be like water, my friend. Well, that's true. Um, be as much as water as possible. You want to take them with you and not keep on fighting the same battles. So about the human-centered design, uh, that we're famous for uh, as designers. I'm guessing everyone here is a designer. I didn't uh, ask that, sorry. Um, from my opinion, it's not some magical superpower that only us designers have. Uh, it's just processes and methods we go through and we know when to apply uh, that creates the value out of it. I think it's up to us to show other people uh, how to use them or at least explain the value by engaging with them. So, I think the one uh, big pro uh, thing you can take up with it is uh, workshops. For example, it can be lightning decision jams, it can be uh, inspiration workshops, it can be prioritization exercises uh, or design sprints, for example. Uh, that's something I will show you quickly through uh, and explain the learning I had there. Um, so let's just go through it. Uh, this was specifically about increasing the value during travel. We have something, you know, pre-booking state, we have after booking, but uh, during booking, Kiwi.com didn't really have something yet. So we want to see what can we improve there. Same context, hectic travel, you know, Sanji can read Babel screaming, but now we were trying it with Post-it, see how can we solve it here. So uh, I uh, messaged the people, grabbed them in a room. Uh, here they are, uh, nice faces. And the people I involved here, uh, I first want to say when you start doing these workshops, it's key to pick the right people. Um, so the people we involved here um, is the tech lead. He has usually, from my experience, a critical point of view. He knows how to get things done. Uh, also means quite pessimistic, uh, which can be really good if you need to know how to make things done. Like I said, you have the business side there, uh, getting good perspective from the business about what are the OKRs, how to uh, make the business healthy, what market opportunities are there. Um, I involved uh, a user here. Uh, so we invited someone with a nice pair of fresh eyes. Uh, he needed a little bit more guidance about these methods, about the design sprint. Uh, so please keep in mind that if you're trying to involve them, I do highly recommend involving users in the process because it's uh, they give a really fresh perspective, which is uh, sometimes a bit um, painful, but very, very good to have. Um, we also, in this case, had the head of mobile present, uh, seeing as uh, you're not running around um, while traveling with your laptop open, you're just checking information on your mobile. So it was good to have him there. The UX designers, uh, so we got our little Venn diagram of the business tech and, uh, and user side covered with someone uh, there. In this case, a service designer, which had the more uh, broad perspective on everything, a good high level view. And uh, one of the key things here is the decision maker. Um, I can't stress this enough. Uh, I had it so many times before uh, that I did a nice workshop. We had some great output and uh, we presented it uh, either to the client or uh, you know, uh, tried to push it through and get it developed. And then someone from higher management stepped in and said, no guys, uh, there were some other priorities. We're gonna go this way. Uh, and the project was completely sacked. All the effort we put in all those six days were just wasted out of the window. I think the key thing about involving uh, the business people early on or the decision makers, the one who's 
going to make it happen. Um, getting the early buy-in from the start, letting him feel involved is, is key to making sure your designs get realized. Um, so get him uh, involved as early as possible. And uh, in this case, I was the one uh, facilitating the team, explaining the methods, keeping track of the process uh, and, and the team dynamics here. So uh, tying back to the nice van there, we got uh, every site covered. We got the business here, the user here, and the, the tech leads there. Um, so make sure that when you invite people into your process, you've got uh, all the um, all the sites covered and not just uh, the attention bias from just the designers or just the tech site, maybe even. All right, so to summarize this learning, um, picking the right people is half the work. Um, if you don't have a decision maker, you're just wasting your time, get them involved as early as possible. Because um, the good thing about having this early buy-in is that a, uh, it puts trust in the process. If you involve them early on, instead of just showing a final solution, uh, they will start seeing uh, uh, how you work. And that means they won't complain to you as much um, when you take a bit longer, because they understand all the steps you have to get through to get to that final solution. Uh, it will make your job a lot easier, uh, at least it did for me. Um, one of the bigger things, I think, especially when involving the decision makers, is it creates ownership of the outcome. So uh, you want, when you're presenting the final solution, you want to make them say yes and amen, uh, because they already uh, partly came up with that same solution. They were involved from the beginning. They were part of the framing of the problem. Uh, they sketched a little bit as well, maybe, um, or at least they threw in some ideas. So they can really see their own input back, and that will make them uh, agree more to the end solution that you propose. And again, it shows the value of the truth of the whole spectrum of design, not just the visual aspect of it. Um, so involve early, uh, expose often. And with expose often, I mean the specific methods of design. Make them feel like the outcome is their input. So this partners in crime, you know, you've got the right people in the room. Uh, you involve them early on. Um, and you've got all business sites covered. Uh, but now what? How do you get these people engaged? How do you get them invested in this design? Sure, I'll take a little bit of a sip. Mm. I think one uh, interesting perspective I've had a project a while back is that um, for the Axenabel, for the, the big corporate, is that we started playing with Legos uh, with higher management. So this is really C-level. Uh, it was about the future digital strategy of the company. Uh, together, me and, and two other facilitators uh, I was co facilitating here. Uh, we started playing with them. Uh, a little bit about Lego Series Play. It's more or less, I will dive in deeper in the talk that uh, 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 Mike mentioned. But the quick overview is uh, you pose a challenge, uh, just any uh, frame challenge. Uh, for example, this digital strategy, how do you see uh, the competition next five years? Uh, then you start building with the Lego blocks you find, everyone by themselves, and then you share through these metaphors that you say. So for example, uh, with this helicopter view, I can clearly see the landscape of competitors, for example. Um, it was really fun to see uh, all these uh, business people uh, play with, uh, with kids' Legos, um, but it was super hectic. I mean, you can see the amount of people here. Uh, thank God we had three facilitators because it was crazy. Uh, but one key thing that helped here, uh, that I want to give to you guys um, is, use templates to structure the chaos. If you involve other people in your uh, projects, um, use templates. It makes your life a lot easier. Uh, here's uh, some preview of what we uh, did for the OXO. So you can see uh, it had the nice challenge written there. You can see some little scribbles of theirs, their, their end uh, product. And what it does, these templates, it, it really eases the uncomfortableness, especially when dealing with something like Lego. This is quite extreme. Um, it, it, it makes them a bit more assured that they have a fallback to go to if they don't really understand it. And it really focuses their attention at the task at hand because they have a nice frame uh, they can work in. So, I mean, in this case, it was with uh, uh, Lego and we just had a paper version, but it can definitely also be uh, in a digital way. Uh, you just have your digital poses there. It's just about structuring it. 
And uh, I, I made a couple so far. Uh, I really enjoy using them. And what I found uh, when applying them in the process is a good template, has a clear task description. So you would just more or less have it to see that if you're not in a room, do they understand what's going on? So have a clear task description. They know the step-by-step -step approach of how to continue. Um, again, it provides an example if they're not really sure what you mean by it. Um, and so it could be, for example, you're talking about job stories. It could be, okay, when I travel to the grocery store, I want to um, have my receipt on my phone so I can uh, look at my expenses later. You really have a, um, a relatable example for people. And uh, it shows why you're doing the exercise. Again, this is important about showing the, the strategic value of design, um, explain the method, what we're using for. Um, so for example, for the job stories, uh, you could say, okay, this really makes us a focused approach on covering all the different scenarios that we could possibly have. Um, so tying it all together, uh, remote friendly, because uh, these were all physical examples, mostly at least. Um, as Mike mentioned, there's a talk coming up uh, next month. So do some uh, promotion here as well. Uh, just sign up if you want to see the remote version of this. Uh, I promise you it won't be uh, uh, it won't be a waste of money. There were, there were some great other speakers from Facebook, uh, from Octo, uh, Octagon um, as well. So check it out. So to summarize uh, what I just discussed, uh, don't start out as a woman army. Uh, I know we're all great designers. We, we, we like our work, uh, especially if you put a lot of time in it, um, but it would be uh, better to help people understand, become those partners in crime with the people around you, with the business, with the tech guys, um, uh, with, with management. Um, involve them, the right stakeholders, uh, early in the process. So they start understanding design. Uh, you show them the value by engaging them in your process and teaching them the methods, or at least showing the value of doing all those steps in between and not just show the end result of your, your nice designs that touch the needs, but show them uh, the steps you took there. So once you all do, do that, we can all be uh, the Indiana Jones of user defenders uh, and that's about it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for advertising of the conference. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> know that it will happen. Um, uh, sorry, but I have the first question. And I have yeah. a microphone. That's why my, my question will be the first one. So uh, I saw the first thing. Um, you decide that, that uh, the page of the trip you have some problem you or someone created this task and how did you do that like how, who created that and why um uh, starting the project you mean uh, no 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 uh, you showed the screen which you redo redid um mm -hmm. yeah. screen, and who created so you came to that work and who created this ticket that you should change the structure of this page uh, it was like you said that, oh, guys, I see, I, I think that my hypothetical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, about prioritizing your work. Um, well, uh, I'm very happy to work at Kiwi because their designers work uh, a lot side by side with the product manager. So uh, it makes it a lot easier. Um, um, so it was just a suggestion for me, like, hey, guys, uh, do you want a quick fix and still have a good impact? I think that will. that's always something that business... Uh, uh, we'll make sure they can they can easily prioritize it because they want quick wins too. I mean, um, so if you sell it in sell it in that way, uh, that's how I step to them. Like, hey guys, I have this list. Uh, it's just some simple steps. Uh, could we start this project and propose it to them? I had, of course, some other work as well, uh, but selling it in that way, um, it was really uh, easy to pick up. Does that answer your question? I don't know who who asked it. I guess, I guess, because you, you mentioned all of those people. So I guess that they created this ticket because I thought that maybe you just came and you was like, oh, guys, you, you don't know how to do that. You have the mistake. I would love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be great. But no, no, unfortunately not. And also I wanted to mention that it's really quite sad to talk about trips nowadays. So it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Want to go to, yeah. Uh, so guys, so I, I see a lot of, 
thanks here, but maybe you have some questions. Could you share them through YouTube or everything is clear to you? Because now you have the, uh, the chance to ask, to talk to Tim. One second, maybe the first questions will, question will appear. I think that I could maybe uh, translate it to question because Peter said that uh, it's the rule when you showed all of your team members, all of them were beautiful. So is it the <laughs> rule to, <laughs> to invite them? I'll, be, I'll make sure to tell them that. Yeah, yeah, they will be happy to hear that. <laughs> I hope that some of them are watching now. Okay, so I guess that maybe there are no questions because I think that your your talk was really full of facts and maybe there are no questions. And uh, the funny so, story I was, so. I was watching YouTube as well and someone put dislike, but then in one minute he, uh, he deleted it and it, it's really cool. So maybe you gave one more fact. So we have a couple of questions. Okay, uh, uh, what do you enjoy more, working for big company or startup and why? Uh, what do I enjoy more to work for? Um, there's something to say for both, of course. Um, I think the good things about startup is that uh, it's very fast-paced. You can really see the results of your work very quickly, um, but it's super crazy. It's very hectic. Uh, there's usually not a very, you know, priority shift from, from day to day. Uh, uh, and the, the fun thing about working for a bigger corporation is that A, your work has humongous impact. Uh, I mean, for now, like you're touching, your designs touch the whole world more or less, uh, but it takes uh, a way uh, longer time to, to see the results of your work. And there's a lot of more political uh, conversations you need to have to, to get your design across. Um, I would say ideally you would have a, a mature startup. Uh, I think that would be ideal for me. I think uh, Kiwi, Kiwi comes quite close, yeah. Thank you. We have one more question. So uh, during the workshops, uh, tech lead is tech lead, product owner is owner, but designer is not user. Do you have some difference in the work with users and designers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was about uh, the user that we invited to the to design sprint, I think. Um, true, yeah, designers are definitely not users. We try to to uh, at least voice their opinion during during our work, uh, but it's I would highly recommend uh, to have the user there because it's a super fresh perspective. They don't know have all the let's say technical knowledge that that us designers have, um, so they really start uh, uh, pinpointing the uh, the important stuff that you don't think about yourself, even if they're there. Uh, and I think the biggest difference between working with them is that you really have to. Um, take their hand uh, and explain uh, every step you're going through. I mean, we're, or at least PMs or tech leads are quite familiar with uh, workshops and design methods like user stories and, and ideation, um, but users are not at all. Um, so you really have to explain it to them in very simple terms. Um, I think that's the biggest difference. But the, the output they give is, is very interesting and very helpful. Thank you. I guess that we got the answer. So we have no more questions. Thank you for everything. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. So I think that that's it for today. Um, I want to say one more thing that you can easily share this, um, the link like which you use now uh, at YouTube. You can easily share it with your friends because uh, all of these lectures were recorded. So yeah, if, if you want to do that. And I hope that finally, uh, very soon, I know that maybe they will stop quarantine, quarantine um, in the middle of June. So I guess that maybe we'll have the chance to meet each other and to drink the beer as we did, uh, did before. So thank you again for coming and see you soon and by the way yeah the next meetup will happen as i said in two weeks and the link is also in the description of this meet, uh, meetup so feel free to join thank you thank you all of the speakers and thanks to all, to all attendees bye Thanks for having me.